Do the first briefing. Yes, sir, of course, uh, Mayor, members of council. Uh, today we got Tony Alger with us, our Stormwater Engineering Center Administrator, and uh, she is here to provide you your quarterly stormwater update on flood control projects across the city. And Tony, thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. I'm going to jump right in. So, as you will notice right off the bat, this slide used to contain 11 projects on it. As I mentioned in my last brief in March, in order to um, better track projects, costs and schedules, and, and honestly to be more transparent, we um, split out projects out of the main CIP. So we now have 17 projects that I'm going to give updates on today. The CIP actually contains 24 flood control projects, but I'm only going to um, give the scope on the projects that have year one funding. So all of them are green because we're just starting out with the exception of the Central Resort District. And this is the big $92 million project um, that is still unfunded in the CIP. So these, this map shows where the projects are located by district. As you can see, there are, oops. They are um, spread out pretty well. Uh, the only project that's not included on this map is CIP 7027, which is the stormwater master planning and modeling project, which covers the entire city. So Aragona uh, drainage improvements project, um, for those not familiar with this project, uh, we're gonna be increasing the pipe sizes and adding new pipes and drainage structures for this project. Um, we're gonna do that along Sullivan Boulevard to Aragona Boulevard. Um, along Oberman Avenue to the outfall. We're gonna make improvements to the outfall, which is called Betty's Bottom. And we're going to continue east on Oberman Ave Avenue, east of Solomon Boulevard. And this project is fully funded. Now we continue to um, work on acquiring temporary construction easements and permanent drainage easements. Um, we are showing a July date to advertise for construction. However, that date could slip. Uh, our real estate department is understaffed currently um, but we're going to do our best to meet that date. And when it does go to construction, it is expected to take 15 months. Asheville Park drainage improvements. As you know, this is a project with a cost participation <coughs> agreement with the developer. The developer is going to construct three new stormwater ponds, expand an existing pond. He's going to construct channels that connect those ponds to um, better convey the stormwater. Uh, regrade and stabilize the um, historic ditch. And then the city is going to construct the stormwater pump station, the gated control stu structure at Flanagan's Lane, and the ditch and culvert improvements at Newbridge and Sandbridge Road intersection. And um, this project is also fully funded. So we have um, split the phase one uh, city projects into three plan sets. The first one is the stormwater pump station. That design is approximately 90% complete, and we hope to cons start construction by the end of the year. Uh, the drainage and roadway improvements project, this project includes the um, maintenance of the ditch between Flanagan's and Newbridge Road. It also includes the gated control structure at Flanagan's Lane. It includes uh, replacing the culvert under Newbridge Road with three 36-inch pipes. And we will also um, raise the intersection approximately a foot just to construct those culverts. Um, that design is approximately 95% complete, and we hope to start construction in December. And finally, the Princess Anne Farm Ditch Stabilization Plan, that design is complete. We're co coordinating with our Public Works Operations Group to utilize one of their construction uh, annual service contracts. Okay, Ms. Henley. Uh, particularly that uh, roadway improvements there at Newbridge, I yes. think that one is really <laughs> urgently needed. How long will it take to, to do that construction? You say it would construction should start in December? Yes, I think we have a year on the schedule to construct that. We do. We want to try to finish it up before the farmer season yep. starts back up in April, May. So well, that's what I would hope. I know that's such right. a, a crazy intersection as far as impacting the Sandbridge Road traffic. Do you think you can do it that quickly? Well, we're going to have to work with a detour as well or to reroute some traffic in that area because you know how congested it is. So we hope to move as quickly as we can working with the, um, the farmers. Right. Um, 
yeah. The only caveat I need to make to these schedules is, is again, um, acquisition. Um, we have the legal department working with us to uh, to get right of entry agreements for the easements that we need. Uh, so we do hope to maintain these schedules. The only easements would be with Fish and Wildlife, though, wouldn't it? Well, and also, uh, even though we are getting easements from um, the homeowners association, and we're not. Um, we're not paying for any easements. We still have to have the plats and everything recorded. That's why we're moving ahead with right of entry agreements. So in April, we uh, gave an update at Ms. Henley's Princeton District Forum on this project, and we gave another one in May to the Ruritan Club at the Creed's uh, Ruritan Barn. The Lake 14 Weir, the construction is complete. However, we still do not have power uh, we're working with Dominion Power to expedite this. Uh, we are able to operate um, the weir manually. The Central Resort District Drainage Improvement Project, this is the one I told you is, um, this is the large multi-phase project. Um, the ultimate improvements will include uh, additional storm drains, a tide gate, a large pump station, and an ocean outfall. Um, that project is estimated to cost $92 million. We do have two breakout projects um, for the CIP. The first one is the 24th Street Culvert Project, which I will discuss in just a second. And the second one is the 16th Street Pump Station Project. Um, that project is fully funded. However, it doesn't receive funding until FY22. So the 24th Street Culvert Project, um, this project is going to replace the 54-inch pipe that's located under 24th Street with box culverts. Um, we're also evaluating the culverts at Parks Avenue and Old Virginia Beach Road. All of these culverts are undersized, and because they are at the downstream location of the system, uh, the stormwater backs up and, and causes street flooding. This um, project is fully funded in the CIP. So we are, uh, we are working on this project. In April, we received um, a design alternatives memo for this project. Um, I, in June, we expected to have the 30 percent design plans. However, uh, we the design plans are still in building two, so we have pushed that off another month, and we hope to have those in July. And when we and we expect to advertise this project for construction next summer. Chubb Lake Lake Bradford. Um, this project is going to address flooding in three neighborhoods in three areas: Church Point, Hollis Road, and the Chubb Lake Lake Bradford area. The ultimate project um, will include additional storm drains, additional culverts, including major box culverts or, at Northampton, Pleasure House Road, and Shore Drive. Uh, it's going to include some tide control devices, additional stormwater management ponds, and channel and ditch clearing. Initial estimates for all of this work is $32 million. We are proceeding with the preliminary engineering report. <coughs> the modeling for this area um, is complete. And that preliminary engineering report, which will um, read, will more clearly define the engineering solutions for this area, that's scheduled to be complete next summer. The interim projects are underway, and the Pleasure House Lake outfall project is going to. Um, we just issued design um, notice to proceed in April, and we hope to advertise that for construction next winter. And the Lake Bradford ditch dredging projects, uh, we hope to advertise that next summer. Eastern Shore Drive Drainage Phase 1, we're referring to this as a parent project, as, um, as I'm going to do with the other large CIP projects. Um, the, the ultimate um, improvements for this include stormwater collection system, tide gates, and four new pump stations. Uh, we have five breakout projects in the FY20 CIP. The Cape Henry Canal Phase 2 project, the Lynn Haven Colony Park Pump Station project, and the Lynn Haven Drive Pump Station project all have FY20. 20 funding, so I will give you um, the scope on those in just a second. And the last two, the Vista Circle Pump Station Project and the Elevate Lynn Haven Drive Project, they both receive funding in FY23, but they are fully funded in the six-year CIP. So the, um, the parent project still includes the Cape Henry Canal Phase 1 project, which is the project where we are um, building a 6 by 4 box culvert. <coughs> between Ebb Tide and West Great Neck Road. It's also going to include drainage improvements on Starfish Road, 
Red Tide Road and Ebb Tide Road. Um, they also, the, the improvements on the side streets include additional inlets and larger stormwater pipes. That project was advertised in April. We had a pre-bid meeting in May. And on May 24th, we issued um, w the first addendum, which was for clarifications on the plans and the specifications. And then on June 14th, we issued a second addendum, which extended the bid opening to July 23rd. We hope to start construction in November of this year and should be complete by the summer of 21. <clears throat> so this is the, one of the first breakout projects in the CIP. This is the Cape Henry Canal Phase Two project. With this project, we are going to widen and deepen the Cape Henry Canal uh, from Starfish Road to Ebb Tide Road, as shown up here on the map, from West Great Neck Road to North Great Neck Road, and going south between Cape Henry Drive and Linhaven Drive. In addition to winding and deepening, deepening the canal, we're going to replace a gravity sanitary sewer line, which is currently beneath the Cape Henry Canal. We're going to relocate that to Cape Henry Drive. This project and the next two projects are interconnected, and I will discuss that in just a second. The Lynn Haven Colony Park Pump Station project. This project is fully funded in the six-year CIP. It includes a new 60 CFS stormwater pump station, which is located on the south side of Lynn Haven Colony Park, and it's adjacent to an existing sanitary sewer pump station. The construction includes um, outfall structure at the Lynn Haven Municipal Marina, and again, this one's going to work in sync with the Cape Henry Canal project and the next pump station, which is located at Lynn Haven Drive. This is a 120 CFS pump station. It's on the <coughs> north side of Lynn Haven Drive between the Cape Henry Canal to the east and West Great Neck Road to the west. Construction will include a tide gate and an outfall structure at the Lynn Haven Marina. And this project, as I just mentioned, works in sync with the Lynn Haven Colony Park pump station and the Cape Henry Canal uh, widening project. So the, the two pump stations will work together to pump down the water in the canal in preparation of a significant storm event. The Sherwood Lakes Drainage Improvements Project. Pretty soon I will be able to take this one off the list. Um, this is the two projects. The first one was the pipe connection between the two lakes, and the second one is the pump station. The interconnect pipe project is substantially complete. Um, it should be complete by July, and the Sherwood Lake Pump Station project is under construction, and we're expecting that to be complete in September. Yes. Sherwood Lake, um, when we're complete with this project, is the model that showing that there's still going to be significant water on the roads, or is it showing that that water should be gone completely? Well, when we have the pump station in place, we're going to have sensors. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the, the water in the lakes we're going to maintain between three and four, so that will never get into the streets. And so it should just, the roadway flooding should be resolved? Yes. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Southern Canal Lead Ditch and Culvert Improvements Project. Um, this project uh, is for improvements in the Southern Rivers watershed. Those improvements may include the pipe, pipe or culvert replacement, ditch cleaning and regrading, and pavement overlay. This CIP, um, we add in an additional $1 million per year, bringing the yearly allocated funding to $2.4 million a year. <coughs> we currently have four active projects in the program, and with the additional funding, we are going to add another project. So the first one is what we refer to as site number five. Uh, it's located between uh, on Dolly Road between Pleasant Ridge Road and the Beggars Bridge Creek Culvert. We're going to clean Beggars Bridge Creek Culvert at Dolly Road, excavate and regrade the roadside ditches leading north towards Pleasant Ridge Road. And in addition, we're going to clear Be Beggars Bridge Creek and the farm ditches on the east and west side of Dolly. Everything is shown in yellow up here on the slide. The ditch work along Dolly was completed in the spring. The work along Beggars Bridge Creek will begin early next year. Uh, we were expecting the permit in July. However, it looks like it's going to be August. Site number six is along Pleasant Ridge Road and it's west of Dolly Road. <clears throat> we're gonna start by uh, reshaping and regrading the roadside ditches on both sides of the road. Public Works Operations started this work um, back in the spring, and they completed about 25 percent 
Um, and then uh, we stopped the cleaning of the ditches to coordinate with the strawberry season. That work will restart this fall. Um, and the next part of the project, we will replace the double 18 inch culverts under Pleasant Ridge Road with triple 18 inch culverts. Um, the design right now for the culverts is at 30% and with the additional funding, we will, um, we will uh, advance the design to the next phase. Which, which culvert is that? It's 18 inch culvert. <coughs> it's under, um, it, it's, Okay, the next one, site number seven. This project's located at the intersection of Pleasant Ridge Road and Charity Neck Road. Uh, we're gonna replace two culverts under Pleasant Ridge Road with larger culverts. We're gonna regrade and road, um, regrade the roadway pavement and reshape and regrade the ditches. And then we're also gonna relocate the above ground utilities. The design for this project is currently at 30% and we expect the 90% plans in September. And site number nine, this, um, this project is located on Gumbridge Road between Charity Farm Court and Gumbridge Court. Uh, so in order to help alleviate the, uh, the roadway flooding now, we're gonna start by cleaning the existing culvert under Gumbridge Road and regrade the ditches, and we hope to start that work in October. Um, then we're gonna replace the 18-inch culvert under Gumbridge Road with a larger culvert. We're gonna widen the ditches, and we're gonna overlay the pavement to add some thickness to raise the pavement a little bit. We're also gonna relocate those above ground utilities. The design for this is underway, approximately 30% complete, and we are expecting the 90% design submittal on next month. <coughs> the stormwater master planning analysis and modeling project. This is the project that is updating the city's stormwater master plans that were last prepared in the 1980s. The funding that is shown in the CIP is to continually maintain these models. Uh, looking at the map, the areas that are shown, I guess it looks like a light blue or maybe a gray to the south. Those are all done using a uh, software called Mike. Um, that particular uh, modeling software allows us to look at the southern wind tides. In the northern half of the city, we are using PC Swim for the modeling software. Yep. Me. Oop, let me go back. What's the uh, color coding there? Okay, so the... the um, the ones that are in the, the light blue at the top, so what, um, drainage basins one, 31, and two, um, they're underway, but they do not have a validated and calibrated model. The ones that are in the darker shade of blue, those are all complete. And the ones in the green, um, the modeling has started on those, but we don't have a draft model at all on those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ones in the green, are you guys still looking for photos of that area? We are, we are and that's actually not in the green area. It's in um, sub um, basin two. So if I go to the next slide, I'll, sh I'll show you the, uh, the schedule. But yes, drain sub basin two. So that's in the Elizabeth River watershed. So if you look at the, um, the table here, we're still awaiting some, some flooding pictures, which we're calling validation um, locations for drainage basin two. And as I just said, the 17 through, um, through 22 drainage basins, those will be complete in 2019. And when I say complete, that's when we have a validated and calibrated model, as well as the Upper North Landing uh, watershed and the Southern um, Rivers watershed, uh, larger watershed, those will also be done in September. So all of the models should be complete with reports and everything by the end of the year. So moving on to Windsor Woods, Princess Anne Plaza, and the lakes. We gave a presentation, a very detailed presentation to you back in May. Um, we had these projects combined for the detailed engineering analysis. We're now separating them out for the individual projects. I did want to still show this slide showing the areas of the neighborhoods. Um, the total project area is over 2,500 acres, 8,500 parcels. The roadway length is approximately 77 miles, and the total assessed value is approximately 2 billion. 
So you have seen this concept plan. This is what we're referring to as the $354 million concept plan. This is the full plan that includes major tide gates and barriers in three locations, two large pump stations, additional stormwater storage, and over 55,000 feet of new stormwater drains. And then we presented to you a phased plan back in May for a cost of $225 million. And with this plan, we still um, construct the major tide gates and barriers at the three locations, which is Thayer Creek, North London Bridge Creek, and South London Bridge Creek. Uh, it still includes two large pump stations at Lake Windsor and North London Bridge Creek. And it still includes stormwater storage um, that would be converting the golf course into stormwater storage and a park. And with this plan, we would construct a, tie, a, a gate at Holland Road to provide some additional storage. So the only storm drain improvements in phase one are the Clubhouse Road project and the FEMA reimbursement projects in Windsor Woods. So phase two includes approximately 10 miles of stormwater drains, and that costs approximately $129 million. So Princess Anne Plaza, this is what I'm calling the parent project now, but the improvements that are required in the neighborhood um, are the tide gates and barriers, the pump station, additional storage, and the increased capacity in the stormwater conveyance system. So we have two breakout projects in the FY20 CIP, both of them very large. The first one is the golf course conversion. That's estimated to cost over $83 million. Um, the funding, uh, um, we don't have funding on that in year one, but I will show you the concept plan again. And the Princess Anne Plaza North London Bridge Creek pump station, that's estimated to cost over $54 million. They both received funding in FY21. Due to the size of the projects, they are not fully funded in the six-year CIP. However, ever, we are showing them funded in the 15-year plan that we presented to you earlier. So this is the golf course conversion concept plan that you saw in our presentation in May. The stormwater um, storage is desperately needed in Princess Anne Plaza. Um, this concept um, has been vetted through Parks and Recreation. We've been working very closely with them to make this not only a stormwater management facility, but a park that can, contains many amen amenities that the public will enjoy year round. I do wanna point out that in the fall, we're going to um, start going out to the public um, to discuss the park amenities and get their input. Ms. Henley. That is a fantastic drawing. Good. It really is. <laughs> when would we expect to have something like that complete? It's a 33-year plan, so um, <laughs> I shouldn't say 33-year, FY33, I'm sorry. It's a 15-year plan. Um, yes. We are going to start, um, we want to start construction um, in July of 2020, but Michael Baker right now is trying to look at how to phase the project so it doesn't disturb the neighborhood when they're um, excavating um, this, this large pond. Yes. Oh, is it <laughs> forecasted so far out because of money or primarily or is it permitting or what? It, it, it's all of the above. <laughs> well, yes, it is all of the above. Um, but also, like I said, they're, they're trying to come up with a phasing plan because they have so much dirt that they need to take out of this mm -hmm. that um, it has <coughs> to be done in small phases. Um, I mean, just the, the sheer size of the, the the dump trucks and the amount of trucks that are going to need to go through the neighborhood to do this, we're, we're trying to do it in a reasonable amount. Space it out. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wood, then Mr. Malucci. So, mm -hmm. so basically, because of the the, the volume of, of the dirt being excavated, where the concern is impact on the roads and things like that. So, yes. do we have? Is there anything in there for? I'm assuming you've got some sort of road repair factor plugged in there as well. We're actually looking at. Um, trying to create an entrance that doesn't actually go through the neighborhood. Um, it's not shown on, on this map, but we're, we're trying to find an area to access it where it's not, where it's gonna disturb the fewest amount of homes. Um, I also wanna point out that uh, we, it's, because it is being constructed in phases, uh, portion, the, the phases that are complete will be utilized for stormwater management as they're done. And will, will the engineering also take <coughs> 
it appears to be very close to houses that, that are probably 50, 60, 70 years old. Are they going to take a look at the impact of the of the geotech moving and absolutely like that? Okay. Yes. Do you have? Do we have an estimated cost on this? Yes, the total estimated cost for this is over $83 million. $83 million? Mm hmm Is that including any, um, any uh, pro property acquisition? This, yes, it does. And it also includes, it also includes the, the, all the park amenities. The project will be paying for all of that as well. Yes. We think that we'll have to acquire some of the properties around it. And are we targeting properties that are already subject to flooding? Or do we have access to it? No, we're right. not, <coughs> yeah. I don't know that we're targeting residences yes. unless we're going to cut through for an access. It's just for access. Just for access. We're picking low, <laughs> low areas to try to do that so that we get a dual, dual return on that investment. <coughs> And everything's voluntary. Right. No, I understand that. Well, I, I just am wondering if we should not consider looking if there's houses that have, I mean, I don't know, looking at that map, what the flood risk in the immediate surrounding area of the rec center, but it might be worth looking at who is subject to repetitive flooding, if that's something, I mean, it may not be anybody. I don't know. I just am wondering, I was just wondering if we'd looked into it at all and maybe well, somebody, it, somebody it, wants to say, I don't want my house anymore. Right. Maybe you incorporate it. Into the we, know, we know the houses. Okay. We, know, we know their locations. Sure. Thank you. I wonder if you could share with me, there's no question in my mind that there's a need for enhanced capacity for, for stormwater in this area. And it looks like a very exciting project to me. And with a lot of amenities that would be welcomed, I, th I would imagine, by most people. But I wonder if you could describe a little bit about the public engagement on this. I mean, a lot of people that I talk to in the neighborhood and throughout the city aren't aware of this project. And um, I'm just wondering if you could share with me just some background on any conversations that have occurred. So we haven't have. started the public engagement on the concept plan yet. We're going to go out to um, to the public in the fall. Um, so up till now, we've been working with Parks and Rec um, on the best concept plan to to accommodate all of these park amenities. But uh, if I might, Mayor, go right ahead, um, Councilman. We. Uh, we have been presenting quarterly flood control projects now every quarter um, since Matthew almost. Uh, it seems like forever, right? Um, we, we, we briefed this uh, last quarter, and we briefed it as a concept the quarter before. And so we're, this, this is not unknown to the civic leagues in the neighborhood, uh, uh, but we will engage in a formal input um, with Parks and Rec at the table, mm -hmm. uh, along with the Public Works team. Um, we're going to have transportation engineers there. Uh, clearly, the, the lack of storage capacity on the plaza side of Rosemont Road is the leading issue, along with being able to close off the tidal impacts that Canal Number 2 provides to, and that's why you're seeing... Uh, the various uh, other projects of putting tie gates and, and pump stations in there. And and without creating this capacity, you know, we, we will not be able to effectively knock, uh, reduce the risk of what Matthew provided to us. Um, so we're very fortunate to have a public golf course there so that acquisition of such a large piece of property doesn't cost us. We forego the amenity of golf, but we replace it by what Parks and Rec tells us will be a much greater use by many more of the public in, a, in this kind of a configuration. So I think they'll be excited about it, and uh, I think they'll be happy to attend all these public meetings. And uh, I couldn't be, you know, this is really a thinking out of the box conversion at a, t at a place most, most important to all of us that were here for Matthews. So. I just want to reassure you that we're going to do this the right way. Yes, sir. And just to add on to that point, um, we attend the Prince Anne Plaza Civic League, which is a combination of the neighborhoods. We're there every single month except when they're off in the summertime. 
And I, I know it's still developing. I think just um, it, this would be a project I think would be of interest not only to the Civic League but to the city yes. at large. Yes. And Absolutely. at the right time, we'll have those discussions. Yeah, and, and in the fall, that those public meetings won't, won't just be for those neighborhoods. It'll be for citywide. Ms. Henley. Well, I know, you know, one they go of back? the concepts that, you know, since <coughs> he's not here today, I can, or Mr. Moss has been talking about, is a referendum at some point. Mm -hmm. This would be the kind of thing that would be a perfect uh, referendum uh, issue because it does affect so many so many different ways, and I think looking for those kinds of things, if we are looking for a, a way to increase the funding earlier, it's these kinds of projects that I think would uh, resonate with mm -hmm. the public in a lot of ways. Thank you. Okay. So we, we showed you this concept plan. This is what a rendering of what the um, North London Bridge Creek pump station um, would look like. We're in the process of evaluating additional alternative pump station locations. We hope to have that um, before we go out um, to the public in early 2020. Um, the engineering design is expected to begin in the summer of 21, and uh, permitting the tide gate and pumping will be required for this project. Um, we estimate that the construction would begin in July of 24 and take two years. And the construction of the pump station is estimated to begin in July of 26 and take six years to complete. And as I said, this project is estimated to cost over $54 million. The lakes drainage improvements. So the, uh, the improvements that are needed in the lakes neighborhood include um, tide gates and barriers and some channels to uh, relocate or to, to, yeah, relocate the flows from um, the two areas, and I'll show you that in just a second. We have one breakout project. This is the South London Bridge Creek Channels and Tidegate. Um, it receives funding in FY22. Uh, it is fully funded in the six-year CIP. This is a rendering of what the Tidegate and channels would look like. The flows from the Lakes Canal and the Green Run Canal will be separated via channelization, as you can see here on the, uh, the rendering. Um, the Green Run Canal flows will be diverted around the gate to better control and direct the flow. Uh, we expect design to begin in the summer of 21 and take two years, and construction estimated to begin in 24 and take two years to complete. Windsor Woods Drainage Improvements Project. Um, we still have three projects, or I should say, actually four projects that are underway on this CIP, um, and they are the Clubhouse Road Drainage Improvement Project and the FEMA Reimbursement Projects, with the pipe projects in Windsor Woods. And we have three breakout projects in the FY20 CIP, the Windsor Woods Pump Station and the Windsor Woods Tidegate. Both have funding in the first year, so I will go over those in just a moment and the Thalia Creek Lake Trashmore Improvement Project, um, that receives funding in FY24. <coughs> that project, the Thalia Creek Lake Trashmore Improvement Project, even though it receives funding in 24, it's fully funded in 24 and in 25. So the Clubhouse Road Drainage Improvement Projects, this was one of the projects that we had submitted for a FEMA grant. We just heard last week that we were not successful in obtaining that grant, so we are moving full speed ahead with this project because we were kind of holding back, waiting on whether we receive that funding. Um, we are finalizing the design, and the, pro the plans are approximately 90% complete. The easement agreements have been signed, and we expect to start construction uh, early next year. That cost is estimated to be $3.3 million. Do they offer, mm -hmm. when we apply for these grants, do they offer an explanation why we so um, we have requested that from them. We just heard on Wednesday um, from FEMA, and actually uh, th this was one of those grants that went through VDEM. They submitted it. It passed VDEM, which was good for us, and they were very encouraging on, on this project moving forward. Um, but as I said, we just heard last week, and we are requesting that information. When we get it, can we get a copy? Sure. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So these are the pipe projects in Windsor Woods that we kindly refer to as the FEMA reimbursement projects. Um, the survey is complete on all of them. 
The engineering design is in progress. Um, we are coordinating with public utilities because um, we're going to be doing water and sewer betterments along with these pipe projects. We expect to start construction in July um, 21 for the first project in July 22, and we're combining projects two and three. Um, the projects are delayed um, right now because of the way that the funding came out on the parent project. Next year, I believe we'll be able to accelerate these if we move some funding around. The Windsor Woods pump station. Um, this is, is uh, this proposed pump station is located on city property. We um, gave you um, a detailed um, discussion about this in our briefing in May. Um, it's on city property that's south of I-264 and Southern Boulevard. It is fully funded in the six-year CIP. It will be a 750 CFS pump station with six 54-inch discharge pipes. Um, the design will begin this fall, and we anticipate construction to begin in the fall of 24, and it'll take four years to complete. And um, because when I say it does, we're going to start design, but not go to construction until 24, we are going to need state and federal permits before construction can begin. So that's a conservative schedule. The Windsor Woods Tidegate, this was the other project that we submitted for the FEMA grant. Um, the location for the tide gate is on city-owned property adjacent to Mount Trashmore Park. The entire gate structure is 60 feet across, and it consists of four gates. The engineering design and the interim pumping is ongoing. It's approximately 30 percent complete. The project is estimated to cost $6.7 million, $6 million, and it is fully funded. We um, hope to award um, the construction contract in the summer next year, and we estimate construction will take two years. So in, in summary, to, to, to summarize the second quarter activities of the three projects, um, so we, we gave project updates to the Civic League, the Prince Anne Plaza Civic League, in April and again in May. Um, the design is underway for the Clubhouse Road project and the three pipe projects in Windsor Woods. The Tidegate project is approximately 30 percent complete on the design. In May, we received the final draft of the preliminary engineering report for Princess Anne Plaza and the Lakes. And on May 28th was when we briefed Council on the detail of these projects. So this map, you've seen it before. These are the dredging projects um, in Windsor Woods and Princess Anne Plaza. Four of the five projects are completed. The remaining project is the Windsor Oaks West 3 project. We uh, finally have easements for two of the three sites, so we are going to move ahead with construction in August. Um, construction is expected to take 10 months. And that's all I have. Okay, any questions? Okay, Michael. Could you go to slide 38? You said you just made a uh, comment there that I just wonder if you could provide some a little bit more detail. <laughs> okay. And that there were um, some delays related to the way the funding was structured. Right. So um, when we, this was a project that we had initially, uh, um, we we initially submitted these projects in the for the FEMA grant. I guess it's been two years now when we did that. And when we initially scoped the project, um, we um, underestimated the size of the pipes that were required. So when the engineering analysis was complete, um, those pipes now need to be larger. We also um, looked at it from a constructability standpoint, and what we were originally showing was too close to some of the homes, so we had to redirect the pipes. And now we're working with public utilities to do water and sewer betterments. So the costs went up. And they went up after we had um, done the CIP for FY20. So that's why I kind of mentioned next year uh, we'll get another crack at it and, and try and rearrange some funding yeah, in order to fund Yeah, move them. some funding around. Mm -hmm. And so if you could just please keep me in the loop on that. Absolutely. If there's anything that I can do to be of service to advocate for um, expediting that moving that along as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And, and that's our goal on all of these projects is get them as quickly I, I know as that. possible. I know. I understand that. And I appreciate it and respect it. Thank you. Jessica. When it's appropriate, 
um, for the dredging product, projects in slide 42, can we get kind of like a before and after of the model so we can sure. say these projects, we anticipate and expect this result okay. and kind of, I think it'd be helpful if we could show the public in a picture that before we did this, this is what we were getting and after we do this, after it's done or in some of the cases has been done, this is what will happen if we model this storm. I okay. Think probably more appropriately be like a Matthew type storm so that we'll have a, since we went through it, we know. We can, I just think it'd be helpful because what I encounter is that we say, okay, we've done these dredging projects, but people can't really, that's not tangible yet. Right. And I don't want to, I don't hope we don't experience another Matthew to see how it works. So it'd be helpful if we could see something I don't know if we could render a prettier yeah. picture. Yes, and I will. Um, I can actually include that. I'll be back again in September. Oh, that would be so I should have that done by September. Thank yeah. you. Hey, Ms. Hanley. Just a, a comment as well, and, and Mr. Belushi's question, I think, uh, uh, was an interesting one in relation to the results. Uh, and you mentioned that if you found out after we had done more work that if we had done it the way you thought at first, we wouldn't have really been solving the issue because pipes needed to be larger and so forth. I think what we're seeing now is a lot more substance to these these projects. When we started, you know, they were just generalities, but you all have just really done a lot of work. I think it's it's showing now. It's really at that point. And Thank you. I know it's slow, but it we is. have to do all of that in order to uh, to make sure we're going to be doing it right. And I, I just can see the difference this time. It's really, really got a lot, lot of substance here. It does. And, and this, this is the stormwater update flood control projects. So this isn't the sea level rise. These are those right. things that are the stormwater issues. And I think that's, that's significant. But it's also awfully good to see as so many of these have that balance to complete of zero. It's showing also how it's getting into the funding stream. So I <coughs> think this is one of the turning point with, with uh, some of these reports. This one really seems to have, have gotten to a certain level, but now we can see progress. I would like to add that they are stormwater projects, but those tide gates and pump stations have our projections of seawater rise built into them. So th this, that, those projects would protect that neighborhood from sea level rise as well as stormwater. Uh, and the other thing we're, we didn't talk about today, because it's on the operation end, uh, operations has going through uh, all of Windsor Woods, Prince Sam Plaza, cleaning, TV, removing all the material that's in there, which is staggering in some cases as to what, and if you even figure out how does it even get in there. Uh, but they're removing all of that and then making spot repairs. So even though the system still needs larger pipes, it is working much better for our routine storms. Uh, and I think we're noticing that in. Um, a much better response from the neighborhoods. We're not seeing the kind of flooding we've seen. Okay, anybody else? Thank you very much. Okay. That was a very lengthy and well done presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, Tony. That was great. Yeah, uh, I neglected <clears throat> to mention that Mr. Moss is on business travel and Ms. Wilson Tony. is away on family leave. Okay, sir, can we move on to the next one? Yes. Um, Yes. Okay. There you are, Hi. Emily. I was Hi. saying. Uh, Sorry, I was hiding over here. So, uh, as you know, Emily is our uh, cultural affairs director, and so I would let her introduce uh, our next briefer, uh, Hillary Platt. And so. Yeah. Thank you, there. members of council, mayor. Thanks for having us this afternoon. I want to just take a second to introduce um, Hillary Platt. She's one of um, our newest uh, city team members and we are really lucky to have her. She uh, is a Navy family, grew up in Virginia Beach, um, went and lived in New York City and worked at the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts for over 10 years where she worked with community partners, cultural groups to develop some really innovative cultural programming. So she's only been here for a few months but um, I, she's here today to talk about her, the newest project. So I'll introduce her. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor Dyer, members of council, Mr. Hansen. Thank you so much for having me here to talk about our latest project at Cultural Affairs. Um, I am super excited and honored to move back home to VB to find how diverse, connected, and vibrant our city has become. And I think we're just at the beginning. 
Today, I'm excited to introduce VB Gigs, globally inspired gatherings that bring people culturally rooted performance, food, community organizations all together for affordable, convenient, shared arts experiences in approachable and relaxed formats. Resident responses found in our Arts Plan 2030 indicated a strong desire from citizens for more cultural diversity in our programming around the city. They also requested more affordability and convenience. Thus, it seemed that creating a pilot series with a variety of different formats for, and the potential for regularly occurring programming might prove more effective than creating a one-day festival. We know we're very, very good in this city at creating festivals, and we love them. So what could I do that was a little bit different? Um, and so we also know that in VB, we like our options and choices. So as part of this program, citizens will also be voting on next year's destinations around the globe through the public input all summer long. I was inspired by the success of series like New York City Park's Summer Stage, The Laundromat Project, Global Fest, and one of my own former series, Lincoln Center Local, which is now known as Borough Link. In studying those, it was really clear that people seek artistic experiences as memory-making opportunities with their families, their friends, their neighbors, but they often can feel as though they don't fit in at performance halls, or maybe they have misconceptions about pricing, attire, etiquette, or they simply don't have time for planning, paying for, and attending ticketed events at performing arts centers when they have a family of five and multiple jobs to shuffle. So VB Gigs aims to address that with performances that are free or low cost without sacrificing artistic quality. That's important. Reflective of diverse cultures, but also honoring the traditional and the innovative. And they're at convenient times for families. They require shorter commitments with little or no advanced planning and are located closer to home, off the oceanfront, and less formal. VB Gig says, yes, wear your shorts and your surf tees. Yes, bring your grandchildren, your grandparents, your babies, your in-laws, your neighbors, but just come and have fun and connect with one another while you're doing something a little different. The next uh, slide is going to talk a little bit about our three curated, per curated performance formats, which have proven successful in some other regions and which I chose to work to customize for our region. Destination date nights combine music, dance, tastings, and fun at a town center venue with a deeply discounted ticket price and close-up experience with artists. Learning layovers partner with libraries to provide uh, interesting performance options intermingled with timely topics for discussion on social and um, political, uh, social cultural topics. Passport picnics celebrate culture, the outdoors, food trucks, and community engagement at city parks. Here's a look at season one. We open this Friday at Zyder's American Dream Theater with Radio Harocho. They're gonna recreate the festival feel of the Fandango gatherings in Veracruz, Mexico. I don't know how many of you have been to Veracruz, but if you go, a Fandango is basically like a big block party. Everybody shows up with their guitars, their dance shoes, their poetry, and their food, and they have a great time. We're gonna recreate that atmosphere inside of Zyder's American Dream Theater, and we've partnered with the Z Celebrate Mexico Now Festival out of New York City. Um, yummy Goodness, a small women-owned business here in town, and they just announced that they will be bringing with them special guest artist Son Pecadores uh, to perform with them as well, and they also launched a very special Facebook and social media video uh, speaking uh, and saying hello to the Virginia Beach community before they arrive. On July 13th, we're going to feature Africa, the Caribbean, and the USA. This program is part musical performance and part conversation. Race Let's Talk About It provides a thoughtful arts experience, inspiring more connectivity between people of different racial backgrounds. Our partners for this program include the ZWHRO, the African American Cultural Center, Tidewater African Cultural Alliance, and Virginia Beach Libraries. On August 10th, we're bound for a pan-Asian adventure, and we'll have Japanese Jewish American violinist and composer Mego Kura uh, with her 10-piece multicultural pan-Asian chamber jazz ensemble at Mount Trashmore. We have the honor of being the second performance to perform on the brand new stage at Mount Trashmore, and we're really excited about that. The show also features Hampton native Sam Newsom on sax and features the world premiere of brand new works from their upcoming album as part of a grant from Chamber Music America. 
on September 7th, we're going to close the season in Brazil with Ologunde, an Afro-Brazilian folkloric celebration. The Bahia region of Brazil is rich in African and Portuguese traditions, which makes for a high energy party for the senses. And Brazilian American Dende Macedo, band leader uh, pictured there on the center drums, um, he's actually going to also provide a recycled music demo before the show for interested families and children. We're partnering with the African American Cultural Center and the Tidewater African Cultural Alliance for that program as well. We envision VB gigs growing and helping to build wider audiences for cultural programming here in Virginia Beach, stronger intercultural community connections, and fostering an awareness of our great city within the wider performing arts community. In closing, we have a 30 second video clip for you so that you can see and hear a little of what's in store. And I also brought the very first sample of what we're doing for children for this series. We will get the full delivery tomorrow, but every kid that attends, as long as supplies last, will receive their very own passport where they can add a sticker for the location they've attended, get autographs from the artists, and write down their impressions of the culture they experienced. So um, our VB gigs video. this year as we introduce and so um, the city has graciously uh, provided us videographers and photographers at this Friday to capture some actual VB citizens participating in our programming. Um, you can find out more at vbgigs.com or you can join us on social media um, and as you can see I have no shortage of things to say so if you're welcome to uh, if you have questions or you want to provide feedback I'm always interested in chatting with you so thank you so much for having right, us here any today. Questions? Yes. Comments and questions. Sure. First of all, I think this is great. Oh, I'm thank you. I'm excited about it. Um, <coughs> excited to see your presentation in our packet. I did have a question um, moving forward, more actually more of like a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to see how we could incorporate this in more of our parks because mm -hmm. I really think that you guys hit the nail on the head and you must have somebody with little children who is involved in doing this because <laughs> it's so uncomfortable to go do something with your kids and then them not go as planned mm -hmm. and then have to feel like you have to leave or so I really love the idea of the outside venue um, my question well my commentary really is have we hope I hope in the future we're going to look at how we can involve our community theaters in this as well mm -hmm. one of the things um, I experienced when I was out of town in um, in Arizona and then also in Williamsburg is they invite their local theaters to do basically skinny down versions of their full length plays and, mm -hmm. and musicals as a way to basically advertise to the public that they're mm -hmm. doing these things but they, like in Williamsburg they were doing a really amended version of the Christmas Carol mm -hmm. um, and Flagstaff they were doing some amended Shakespeare stuff and mm -hmm. it would be really cool to see something like that incorporated too in this mm -hmm. program I realize it's a pilot but Mm -hmm. um, I think this is great, and I'm very excited for you all. Well, thank you very much for your um, encouragement and your comments. <coughs> We're certainly excited for it to grow, and there's definitely a lot of um, opportunities for building off on the program. One of the things we've talked about a little bit is how to connect our local artists um, who specialize in the global or the region that we're featuring um, with the artists that have been successfully touring the world. Um, so one of my hopes is that next year perhaps we can have local artists or local organizations provide artists who are specializing in that regional performance um, as openers for the touring acts so that we can begin to build networks between people who are trying to create careers here in world music with people who have had successful careers in world music all over the globe and, and get that network happening and uh, allow them to learn from each other. Good. Michael? 
Well, I don't want to take a lot of time because I know we have a very full agenda, but I just want to express my appreciation for the work that you're doing. And uh, I, have too, am very excited about the program, particularly because I recognize that it creates a, a, a really rather large, significant point of entry for many families and individuals into the world of arts and culture. And we rec I recognize how important that is for our economy, how important that is for um, the social fabric of our city. Uh, one suggestion I would have, or maybe you've already thought of this, is um, creating a bridge mm -hmm. from that point of entry to our more traditional, say, um, art museums and, um, and performance centers, because in fact, um, I think m most people who represent those um, institutions would say that they are places for everyone, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that historically maybe not everyone feels welcome. So if we could maybe think about ways to, which I know you're already doing, but enhance the partnerships that exist so that we can maybe um, more effectively bring people to the table mm -hmm. in the more traditional settings as well, because in fact those are meant for everyone mm -hmm. as well. But I think the mm -hmm. great way to move that forward is with what you're doing. So I'm so grateful. Thank you very much. That's exactly the mission behind this. Um, as a military kid growing up here, um, I had the dad who never took any of the overseas gigs. And so um, I was always jealous of my friends that got to travel. We didn't go to a lot of theater. It was hard with different duty shifts and just not having a ton of money and different kids' schedules. And so um, being able to go to public programming like this really altered my life. I've seen it work with students and children all over the place. And the model of going out into the public to libraries and parks in New York City actually was very successful in bringing people into Lincoln Center. Um, one of our most accessible theaters right now uh, with the work that they're doing is the Z, which is why we chose them for our partner season. But your point exactly is one of the main driving factors behind this series, is how to partner that. with them to bring people to the venues that we have in town. Anybody else? I just want to thank you and your department. Welcome back to Virginia Beach. Thank you. Once again, another positive step to mm -hmm. making us a year-round destination, a city of inclusion, and bringing positivity to this great city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Hillary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Emily. You know, Council, you all uh, provide those venues by which they can fill it with the culture and the entertainment that they're bringing. When you look at what your partnership with uh, uh, Block 9, Phase 6 at Town Center with Ziders and the partnership of allowing him to bring, uh, to bring his private investment to bear and then being able to transition that. Uh, your work with uh, TCC and this fabulous J. Luce uh, Library where we can use that venue and Michael, I, I agree with you on the more established ones, but to be able to get out and go to Mount Trashmore and, and, and wait till you see the new amphitheater that they're building there with the backdrop to the lake and, and uh, allowing your Parks and Rec to go ahead and construct those things and, and, and take advantage of that space. And then the big partnership that happened in Bayside with uh, the whole um, Williams Farm uh, Rec Center and the park associated with it and all that's going on there. And so you, you invest... Uh, you invest wisely across all your districts, and uh, and I think that having uh, Hillary and Emily take that program to to the to the folks and <coughs> to give that opportunity for them that otherwise might not be able to go to the other venues, I think it's going to be amazing. And so, uh, congratulations to them, and thank you to you all for continuing to invest across all your city. All right, item number three, we got uh, Alice Kelly, our Interim Director of Finance, uh, going to provide us our uh, financial statements, and uh, that would be, since we're uh, in June, that would be one month back in May. Um, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Woods, City Council members, I'm happy to report on the May Interim Financial Statements on uh, our glide chart, our city revenues and expenses compared to two years past. The red line is our, ex, uh, um, our expenditures for two years past. Our green line shows that our expenditures are about 90.1%. 
slightly lower than the two-year trend. Our revenue expense, our revenue trend for the blue line and our purple for the um, two-year trend are very much matching. If you go to the next slide, we have the year-to-day revenues of $970.4 million. That's 78% of our budget, which is down slightly from FY18, but up $30 million from 2017. Our real estate tax collection is down 10.2 from 2018 as of May 31st. So we have some timing differences here because of the collection was st extended out a little bit um, for the month of June. But we checked it as of June 25th and we're at 98.3% of our levy and 99% um, of our budget. So we're, we're right on line with our real estate collection. And um, for our expenditures, We've expended $1.12 billion as of May 31st, which is 90.1% of our budget. It's up about $45.4 million of, from the previous year, and that's due to increases of personnel expenses, and we had a $16.1 million transfer to schools. Our trustee tax revenues, this is a chart we haven't shown you uh, in the past few months, but in May, our hotel tax was up 20.1%. Uh, from the prior year's May, which is collections, May collections represent April sales. Our meals tax was up 6.7% and our amusement tax was up 35.3%. And for year to date, our hotel tax is up 4%. Meal tax is up 4.5% over the previous year and amusements tax is up 10.8%. So is the hotel tax because of something in the water? Um, Yes. I mean, that's what happened in April. So yeah, yes. because normally it's not a, not not as a big hotel much. month. Okay, good. Right. Jessica? Oh, I don't oh, have a okay. question. Sorry. What caused that big amusement tax increase? Even for the year to Something day, in the water. So that was something in the water as well? Yes. The trustee taxes are all um, from events, and that was something in the water was the big Got main event. I, for what it's worth, though. A hotelier I know who should know said it's not just something in the water that that's important, but it was also the way the weekends fell and east and the schedule of sure. Easter and the weather generally in the month. All of that combined to be a record month. Sure. Um, our projected revenues for FY20, the revenues that are expected to exceed our budget are real estate tax, personal property tax, telecommunication tax, and other local revenues. Revenues expected to be under budget but is still exceeding prior years are our general sales tax, our meal tax, and our utility tax. Our projected general fund budget, this is very preliminary because we're still in May, and, um, but our policies to be between 8 and 12 percent of our uh, revenues from uh, the, the following year, and so we're projecting about a 10.41 percent uh, unassigned fund balance for general fund, which is right in line with what uh, our policy is. So our next step is we have a bond sale scheduled for July 10th. We have our closeout for the fiscal year of August 15th. We will present unaudited financial statements October 7th, and we'll have the audited results December 11th, 2019. Any questions? Anybody? Thank you. Okay, Jim comment. and then Mrs. Hemmer. I, I think a comment. I mean, if you take a look at the at the difference this year over previous years, and I understand what, what Guy's saying. I've talked to some folks in the hotel industry who've said something in the water was kind of like the July July 4th or Memorial Day or whatever coming early, which which is good. But I think when you look at this, if you just do a quick quick tally on, on just trustee taxes, you're talking close to a million dollars and and extra trustee taxes, excluding everything else related to that. So that's certainly a, a nice success story for the city there. Yeah. Yes, Henry? I was just going to comment on the bond sale. You say July 10th. We're still moving mm -hmm. forward at that time. Everything yes. Everything seems favorable. And yes, and we'll have rating agency results very soon, and we will be selling our bonds. And rating but agencies did come as they had been projected. They did not come. We had a, a, a telephone conference instead as because it was just the timing was just – not the right timing for them to come, but we did ha we did continue the schedule for our rating agency presentations. We just did it over the phone as opposed to them coming. They were very gracious mm -hmm. in light of our tragedy 
to do it that way. I couldn't be more proud of Alice and all her team and a couple of our deputy city managers who broke away to have those conversations with them. <clears throat> I can tell you that our preliminary information is we're in great shape with uh, we always like triples and uh, you know, we can't say what we haven't received in writing, but I'm very proud of this team. They continue to deliver what your expectations are. So going into a very favorable bond environment, um, bond sale environment, um, we're clicking on all eight cylinders. That's good to hear. I was a little worried about timing. But... No, and, and we should have the results for the Friday package. So. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great report. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mr. Manager. And your that? last item for the day is the pending items. And... Uh, You've got 55 minutes, Mike, so take your time. <laughs> well, actually, I could take about one minute. Sorry. All right, one minute. It's going to be pretty quick. Planning, planning item. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be taking you through the planning item, singular, <laughs> to be considered by the council at your July 9th meeting. For July 9th, we have just one item, a conditional use permit for a communication tower. Both staff and the Planning Commission recommended approval of the application at their July 11, 2018 public hearing. At the time, the tower had a proposed height of 156 feet. Following the public hearing, the project was put on hold in response to concerns raised by the Navy about the height of the tower. With input from the Navy, the FAA conducted an aeronautical study of the tower height, and as a result of their findings, the proposed height of the tower has been reduced to 135 feet. No other changes are proposed for the facility, and there was no citizen opposition raised at the public hearing. Are there any questions for staff? Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Uh, are we going to have a backlog? Uh, I just put it on your desk. Um, oh, yes, yes. As far as the planning items that were on hold from the June public hearing, uh, more than likely the backlog you'll end up seeing is at, at the, your meetings at the end of August as we start to get some of them kicked free. Um, a lot of the, all the items from the June public hearing were pushed to the, the July public hearing. The August public hearing for the Planning Commission will more than likely be double because the items that were supposed to be on July were moved to August. So then September, your end of August and September agendas will probably be very large. Last year, the planning commission kind of took a month off. They're not doing that. No, ma'am. Okay, is that it? Okay, with the council's um, permission, we have one more item of discussion. I think it's going to be very important. Mr. Wood. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to pass out um, a resolution. I believe I've spoken with everybody around the table. I've emailed Mr. Moss and I've uh, emailed Mrs. Uh, Wilson about this and this is a resolution I believe everybody has seen this and I've heard positive feedback on a resolution directing the city auditor to engage an independent consultant to conduct an independent review of the May 31st tragedy the the purpose by and, and it although it says requested by vice mayor wood my goal is is for everybody to to have their name on it or just say requested by city council because I think it is extraordinarily important that we do this as a group and not as any any individuals on this I think it's it's critically important but but the key elements of this is is first off it's a city auditor who would manage this contract the contract would be the city auditor would uh, look at different entities that have done these sorts of reports in the past I've, I've looked at I've read the Virginia Tech one and the Charlottesville one I was scanning through San Bernardino Sandy Hook and the Vegas Vegas reports also the interesting thing is the time frames on those which I find interesting Tech was four months, Charlottesville was six months, San Bernardino eight months, Sandy Hook about two years, and Las Vegas was about a year in terms of these things. But, but the elements is, is more taking a look at uh, employment history and workplace interactions, review of city policies, procedures, practices, um, facility security, prevention of workplace violence, employee alerting, that, that sort of thing. that are kind of the things that probably would not show up on a police report. Um, it would uh, not commence until after 
the city auditor had assurances from the police department that, that such an investigation or review would not impact their review because clearly that's the most important thing right now is for them to get through it and that uh, and it would be completely independent uh, review. So I, I would also point to the back, if you look at the, the second page, I started talking to him in June 20th significantly earlier than, than the letter we all got today that the media got yesterday. So um, I'm, I'm happy to um, answer any questions or, I mean, again, Mr. Mayor, my goal is, is if, if at all possible, you know, for, for us to put this on next week for the entire council to, to, be, to be part of it and, and for it not to be reflective of any individual on here. So Okay, certainly put my name on it, but any discussion right now? Jess. Just, and then Barbara. I know you and I spoke on the phone about it, but just for the people that are watching, it's so that the city auditor is only acting as our manager of it. It Correct. would be a true yep. independent yes. investigation by an outside firm that would be handling all of it. It's city money being spent, right. so we have to have somebody manage and, it. And, and Lyndon would just be the person who obtains the report and then... Like, like, like the annual the comprehensive annual financial report that, that Lyndon does. So, so this yeah. document comes in, Lyndon engages in that case an external audit firm and, and does that. So. Do you know in your conversation um, when we think that just do we have an idea of when this would begin as terms of when we could probably contract it out? So I, I think based on just and, and what I did is I, is I spoke to Lyndon and also to Mark just to make sure that, that you know, they both felt competent, uh, confident of, about this. I think I think Lyndon said that once this was passed, you know, he would he would take a look at the different firms that, that have been conducted these, kind of come up with a short list. And Mark's got to talk to him about procurement and, and how it can be done because I guess, Mark, it's a professional services procurement, which uh, is somewhat it, it different. Be, than it, it could be, uh, depending on the, uh, the, the type of expertise that we're ultimately looking for. Uh, I, I think that's most likely... If you're looking at a law firm, then it probably could be done as a professional procurement. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing, because if you take a look at, um, like Charlottesville was done by a law firm, uh, the tech one was kind of a hybrid. There was a law firm. There was also an independent investigative group involved in that. So it really depends. I mean, when you look at these, they're all different because of the, the circumstances surrounding what, what occurred. I mean, the, the tech one was very heavy onto the mental illness aspect because that particular person was not supposed to have access to firearms but did um the charlottesville one there was obviously a huge lead up to it but before all those problems um san bernardino and sandy hook and those are ones that just kind of came out of, out of nowhere so um you know i'm, I'm you know I, I would i would love for the entire council to to get behind it and and we do this as a team but i, I just have one more thing yeah. I, I haven't read through this in its entirety but i would really like it for that when lyndon picks who is going to be doing this, that he gives us kind of an update of who we're hiring, what they're going to oh, be yeah. doing in the scope, and that would be great if that could be public so that the public is reassured that this is a true independent investigation. Jess, and I agree, but let me tell you one thing that was evident, that's been evident with Lyndon Rumea since oh, he's agree. become our internal right. auditor. He, this is beyond transparency. You know, as last week when he brought forward some, you know, details that were embarrassing, but necessary and corrective action was taken. Since Lyndon has been brought on, he's been nothing but a stellar champion of transparency. Agree. Okay, Mrs. Henley, then Aaron, and then Michael, well, and I then know, Guy. There are a lot of other people that might want to speak because before I do, because I, I really want to know what is an independent investigation? Um, how can it be independent if, if it's being managed <coughs> by the city? Is it still going to be something the public's, what does the public expect? And the last thing in the world we ought to have is a bunch of politicians telling investigations what they should do. And the first investigation should be our police department. Precisely. And exactly. we should do nothing that in any way even <coughs> appears that we're trying to influence that investigation. And how we know what we're going after until we hear from that investigation, I don't know what we're trying to accomplish. So maybe through all of this discussion, somebody can tell me what is an independent investigation, what is it supposed to be finding, and how in the world is it ever, I mean, I've got to understand more about the why and the what. 
Jim, why don't you take a crack at it, then I have a comment, too. Sure. Well, I mean, the first thing is I completely agree with your assessment about the criminal investigation having priority, which is why bullet number two is, is, is important on here that says it will not commence without written assurance from law enforcement that such a review will not interfere with the current law enforcement investigation of the tragedy. <coughs> um, with respect to what it would take a look at, that's, that's in paragraph one. And, and I think that that kind of shows shows this. I, you know, it, the the independence part of it would be. And, and again, if you and you can download or, or read the <coughs> and, the, and the, the the Charlottesville ones that, that were done by independent entities, I, I completely agree with you. The politicians should not be involved in this. So far away from it. And and I think I think the fact is is that if we have the auditor manage it. And then, I mean, ultimately, if the city's paying for it, somebody's got to manage it. It's not independent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what people think. Yeah. And what, what, what is it that people are saying is an independent investigation? I don't know. I mean, so I, maybe somebody can explain it to me between okay. now and next week. If I could just say, and then, uh, you know, we'll go to Aaron. You know, I think an external review. There were, there, there's been discussions about this for a couple of weeks, and I know there has been a lot of, you know, um, you know, public, you know, um, request for, you know, something to be done. And I don't think anybody at this table, you know, can say, well, we want, you know, answers. We want to communicate with our public and think this is an external review that hopefully the way I look at it will fill in the gaps that the, um, the police <coughs> investigation would not fill. In other words, there's a lot of things about work environment and some other things that the vice mayor mentioned, you know, that don't fall under the purview, and you correct me if I'm wrong, of a police investigation. So what we're trying to do is really expand the picture, you know, because once again, when you look at the magnitude of the crime scene and what was going on and all the other factors that, you know, go into things, you know, and I think one of the reasons for the delay was, you know, to make sure you know, don't forget the FBI was in that building, what, for 10 days after 45 agents and got turned over to us. And uh, the interviews, I think like 240 interviews or 300 uh, interviews being conducted. You know, to me, everything, a lot of it is about the timing, you know, to make sure that any type of call for an independent review did not impede the investigation. And, you know, if we look at it, you know, we take a look at the stellar performance of our police department and how they reacted and how we conducted ourselves as a city. I have 100 percent confidence that our police are going to be doing a, just a stellar job at looking into it. But it's going to take some time. And that's the frustration the public has, you know, right now. But, but by our willingness to have a third party. Uh, and then under the auspices of an internal order who is wholly respected by, you know, the entire, the entire region. Um, you know, but I think, you know, as we move forward, Ms. Henley, you know, I think it's going to be a work in progress about the exact nature and scope. But at least, you know, it'll be brought forward and we will inform the public by our actions here at this table. Aaron. Um, I'm just going to say supporting a third party investigation I support this the thing I think is most important that we keep in mind that is it's not about the city it's about these 12 families precisely and also those who are in the hospital this is what this independent independent investigation is about they need answers they have loved ones who will never who will never see again if this helps them bring that closer to um, healing then we ought to do it I think as um, elected officials, I, I agree with Ms. Uh, Henley, we don't, I don't think any politician should be. You know, any, it's not yep. a, For me, it's not a political, it's not a political matter. Mm. It's, a, it's a morality matter, making sure that we can provide as many answers, clear answers, transparent answers as we can for the families to be able to help them um, any way that we, we can. So I necessarily don't know what the investigation, independent investigation may find. I'm, I'm not sure. I, but anything that can help these families have some sense of, uh, bring them some sense of peace, I think we, we, ought to, um, we ought to support and make sure that it's, it's clearly uh, transparency, that those, those lines are not interfering with our uh, 
police officers as well, so I, I do want to make sure that they're able to complete their investigation from first. Um, immediately after that, I would like for um, spare party investigation, independent investigation too. Couldn't agree with you more. That's what the focus should be, can and should be. Okay, we're going to go with Michael and then Guy. I'd like to make a, a couple of points. The first is uh, that I'd like to um, just say that I couldn't agree with uh, uh, Vice Mayor Wood more that this is a topic that uh, we should really collaborate on and find consensus on. This is a matter that is so serious and, and, and that is in the, um, the public interest that we work together and speak with one voice on this. And so I agree with him uh, wholeheartedly that this is something, and I appreciate what's happening now around this table to, to try to find that consensus. Um, I guess I have a question about the timeline. I wonder if anyone could provide um, more detail about uh, about the, about when the police or the law enforcement who are engaged in the investigation would find it appropriate to commence the independent investigation. And the reason I ask that question, and if it's not, <coughs> if we don't have that answer now, then perhaps we could get that before we have the discussion next week. But the reason that I ask that is because I agree with Council Member Rouse that it's not all, it, that it, it, this is about the victims' families and it's about their friends and loved ones. No doubt they need this information and they need confidence in this information in order to grieve and to heal and to move forward. But it's also a matter of public interest. I think I'm hearing more and more and more that citizens, um, whether they had a direct relationship to this event or not, want to have full confidence that they know all the facts. And so that's why I think this is important. And, um, and I think that for some who are engaged in that conversation, time is of the essence. But I agree that there's nothing we should do should interfere or disrupt the law enforcement investigation. It's a principal concern to me. But I wonder if there's any more information that we could have about when it would be appropriate to commence. Okay. Uh, I think the public would like to Okay, Mr. That. Tower, before uh, Mr. Wood had a response to Michael, and then we'll go to Guy, and then we'll go to Sabrina. Well, the, the one thing I would say is I, I agree with with both both of what, what you and Aaron said. Um, you know, I think it's certainly in public interest. It's certainly the families, but I, also we have to remember all those employees who came and spoke last week, and, and I think that was extraordinarily difficult for them to do that. And I think we owe it to the employees as well. Um, I, I, I think it's perfectly appropriate for for us to ask the manager to talk to the police chief and see see when he would think would be an appropriate time for it. I'm I'm certain that they have you know some sort of outside date that we could do. You have to keep in mind that that if if we do this on the second or if people want to still talk about it until the ninth, you know I th I think that's fine too. If if we come up with with, with some common ground, and then ultimately it would take, you know, Lyndon some time to, to, to go through the procurement process. So I think, you know, stuff would not be lost in that time frame. It's just when they could actually kick off kick off the thing. But but I, I think, Michael, I think it, that um, I feel certain the manager could, could get us that information at some point. Okay, Guy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I just want to, in the, in the spirit of collaboration and getting together, I, I would also like to pick up on what other people have said. I think uh, Ms. Henley's comments about keeping the politicians out of it is right on the money. I think Aaron's comments about uh, how important this is to the families uh, and the uh, living victims of this, and I use that term very broadly, is important. I think Michael's comments that it's broader than just the families, it's the community is interested in knowing, and I think beyond knowing, as I've said before, I think this is part of our deepest first obligation to provide for the safety of our employees and our citizens in an ongoing. This ought to be very valuable to us in making planning for everything from uh, our new buildings to, uh, to events and, and the like. So I think it, it's all of that ought to be layered in here. The other point I would make, and I had a very interesting conversation with Ms. Wooten about it today, and I noticed Mr. Woods using the term 
being managed by the city auditor. I, act, I very much thought the city auditor myself was an appropriate and, and a good choice of a person to do it. Uh, I know Ms. Wooten had some concerns. She can speak to that, but I, I don't see the word manage in this resolution. And I want to know, I, I guess I would want to know, because uh, I'm new to the council, what's included in the management. I see the auditor as being simply a point of contact for the outside, that, that there will be, there's no managing in the sense of directing, do this, do that. The management is oh, the hiring process, determining who wants to hire, engaging them, and then scheduling whatever they want to do in, in whatever fashion the independent people want to do it, and then at the end of that, receiving a report from them. If, if, does that yeah, Mr. summarize? Wood. And maybe there's yeah, more so, to it than well, that. No, I mean, it, but if it is, I'd be, I'd be interested in what you have well, in mind, Jim. It's, it's obviously city money. I mean, because the source of the funds is listed here, right. that it would come from the city. So th this is not something that we could just give to some outside entity and say, here, take our money and engage, engage in that. Um, it, it would have to be somebody, you know, a trusted entity that could that could handle taxpayer funds to do this, and a um, carefully worded contract, I assume, correct. into what their responsibility. And, and so, I mean, like as in any contract, there would be, you know, a, a state. You know, basically, this is what we want you to do. And you, being an attorney, you know the elements of a contract, but also the milestones as they go through to make right. sure they're hitting their milestones and and hitting delivery dates and things like that 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 we expect, and then. You know to work through it and, and I mean the the city attorney used the word engage I mean I have no problem if you want to put engage and manage I mean no that's, I don't that's want to put man, engage okay. and manage I'm happy with it the okay. way it is my point was yeah. I think Ms. Wooten was not happy with the word manage and I wouldn't be either if it were in the document because it might imply some directional control that I don't that's think we're about talking the contract, about contract not the actual yeah. I, and I think we need to make that yeah. clear yeah uh, that's a good point. Thank you. I'm sorry. Here you go. Ms. Wilmer. So for me, I had a chance to talk with Jim about it and had a chance to talk to the city attorney about it. And I listened to, you know, their feedback and I asked questions about the management part of it because, um, number one, I, you know, my heart breaks for the families and listening to some of the, um, stories about how they weren't able to locate their loved one's body. It's been several months, or excuse me, weeks, and they haven't had an update, uh, and, and they have questions. And so when I saw a recent report that I, uh, I got through the city, and it talked about um, doing the investigation, and we weren't certain whether it was going to be eight months, ten months, it could go, you know, next year and beyond, I started to think about, again, the families and how they've continued to wait. And so my conversation with Jim was, number one, first, the, the appearance with the city auditor being a part of um, the independent investigation. I know that you say he's just going to help select the independent organization. That's fine. But uh, I remember hearing some things about, you know, being, you know, it, as far as the departments, you know, um, being that person who will kind of help them navigate through the departments. And, and that's understandable. Um, but I think for me, I just, <coughs> I, I would rather not have the appearance of the city being involved over, intertwined with an independent um, investigation at all. Because if it is, an, in fact, an independent investigation, we don't need a city person, auditor, or anyone intertwined in that whole process. And, you know, the thought was, well, who's going to be the person who's, you know, um, going to control the funds? Of course, the, the independent entity would not control the funds, but that should be that limited scope. You, they retain the organization. Um, whatever payments that need to take place, fine. That's the end of your scope. Otherwise, to me, and I cannot reconcile it, that the city, city auditor being a part of it is an independent investigation, no matter what you say about it or what the response is, or he won't have 
you know, um, be involved in this part or that, we're not going to be there watching what he does, what decisions are made. I don't know about that. I just know what I hear and my sense is it's not going to be independent. Um, that's number one. Number two, my concern is with expedience. What if you don't get a written confirmation from um, chief of police that this investigation, you know, will not, I forget the wording here, receive, if you don't receive written assurance from the law enforcement that such a review will not interfere with the current law enforcement investigation, then what? Is the investigation going to be hindered? Because you're not, I mean, you're, I'm sure you're not going to usurp um, that authorization and do what you want to do. So for me, that particular wording right there is, um, says if it, it doesn't give me the assurance that the, it will go forward and that it will go forward in a timely manner. So with that in mind, um, I, I contacted, you know, the city attorney and I said, listen, my reason for doing a separate resolution is one, expedience, because people are asking um, for answers now. Um, and not saying they're going to get them now, but when I say expedience, expeditiously looking at um, an investigation, I mean doing everything that's necessary to move forward without reservation of whether you get the written assurance or not. Expedience for the families is important. I keep hearing it. I've been uh, emailed about it. I've been text, I mean, information coming on Facebook. Expedience, expedience, expedience. That's what I hear. And so the resolution that I have encompasses is expedience. And that's the main um, reasoning for this resolution. And two, the other part of it is, you know, once uh, the investigation, you know, is started, for me, uh, to include in here that the city auditor is not so involved in the process. Um, and you say that he's not, I get it, but I think his role should be limited. Give the independent agency um, the authority to operate. And I don't know who that comes from, but once you give them the authority to operate, let them manage the investigation, let them ask for what they need, get out of their way, and let them do the investigation. That's my perspective. That's what this resolution is about. And it came over <coughs> just thinking and going over and over. Because I could have, you know, when I talked with Jim, I said, okay, this sounds like it's going to be reasonable. It sounds like it's going to be right. But after I went over it, thought about it, transparency is key. You only get one chance at doing an investigation that's independent. If you do it and it starts out, and it starts out and it's not the way uh, transparent, it's, it doesn't have the appearance of a conflict because with a city auditor over that and instructing that there is a conflict. You only have one chance at doing it. You gotta do it right. So that's what this resolution is about. You have a chance to look over it. Uh, there is an option if you don't, I mean, a lot of you, you know, I'm not telling you what to do. This is the conviction that I have, and it's in this resolution, and it's for you to review at your leisure whether you would like to or not. It, it's up to you, but that is what um, my consensus is on the matter. Any other comment? I have a question. Yeah, Aaron. First, uh, Ms. Wooden, uh, Council the so the difference in, in your resolution is, um, or this resolution put forth, that it's completely a third party independent investigation? Is that, yes. Is that the difference, the main difference? Well, it's and completely from start to finish. Oh, okay. With no, in my opinion, we don't need the city auditor involved. We need, his access needs to be very, it needs to be very limited. <coughs> in fact, I'd like to see what the access he would have would be um, in the investigation. Otherwise, it clouds an independent investigation. Michael. Michael, Aaron, then Michael. Uh, so I guess for the attorney, so uh, 
Jim said there has to be a city auditor in order to pay for it. We had to give the money to a city auditor <laughs> to pay for it. We couldn't. Have You're going to have somebody is going to have to sign the contract by which the services are performed and on behalf of the organization. That could be whoever this council designates it to be. Some of the issues that are being looked at relate to part policies, practices, and procedures that are undertaken by subordinates of the city manager. The city auditor has no role in those, and so it was actually my suggestion, Mr. Martingale, uh, who, who was the first person to put this out, suggested that it be done through my office. I didn't think my office would be the appropriate entity to sign the contract because if it, there is, in some event, civil litigation, it's my office that would be called upon to either directly handle that or to manage that litigation so I could see the public not believing that if I were the contracting officer on behalf of the city, that that was truly independent. But, but the auditors is your independent auditor for exactly that purpose. That's what your auditor does. He's not beholden to the manager. He's not beholden to the city attorney or any other department director. He is completely free and clear. He can, he can you know, and he's proven in, in the findings that he's made and other reports that he's done that he is, he, he is that independent auditor. So that's why, that's why the auditor was suggested in... Uh, in, uh, in the vice mayor's um, uh, resolution. But, Ms. Wooten, if, 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 if the council wants the city manager to be the person to engage the, uh, um, the independent organization, that's direction, that, that direction is legal. Council can do that. Uh, council can direct me to do it. Council can direct. But, but you have to have some city official who's going to sign the contract and then ensure that the contract is performed in order to then justify making the payment of tax dollars to that entity. So it's got to be some city entity. And so I okay, agree. Okay, hold on, hold on. And I think I said before, go ahead, take care of the transaction, sign the contract, then that's your limited involvement. Okay, that's, okay. Uh, that's to me, okay. Mr. you know, Wood, makes sense. Mr. Wood, Sabrina? Yes. Just hang on. No, I just okay, I understand. But Mi Mr. Wood was next on cue. Right, and I, okay. and I think I waited until everyone spoke and Fine. it was my time to speak. So I don't think I'm doing anything that's, you know, a problem. Good. Well, everybody will have a chance to speak. Mr. Absolutely. Wood? Absolutely, I agree with that. I'm fine. Um, the, the, the difference I see on this is the title says, under the one says resolution directed to the city auditor, the other one says a resolution directing the city manager. Um, what line do you want to get? The, the title okay. at the very top. Okay. And then paragraph one of both of them, one says direct the city auditor, the other says direct the city manager. Um, th this one that Ms. Wooten's done is, is a significantly much more narrow scope. Um, looks to be just focused on one individual for the most part. And, um, and it also calls out for a report from the FBI, which we know according to the FBI, is going to be months and months and months away prior to to that to that occurring. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I still, I, I understand your reasoning behind it. I think that that, that we may be talking opposite <coughs> of, of each other because I, I truly think this is this is independent and probably, frankly, more independent than, than that. But um, this kind of exactly what I was trying to avoid. I wanted everybody to try to try to come together on this, which is why I reached out, but, you know, however we need to do it. Okay. Uh, Michael and then Jessica. One of the several distinctions between the two resolutions, noting my preference would have been to work through them together, but um, if, if that's not possible, one of the distinctions is that um, Vice Mayor Wood's resolution includes um, line two. Yeah, sorry, line 26, a written assurance from the Virginia Beach Police Department that such review will not interfere with the current law enforcement investigation of the tragedy. And I see, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I see no such assurance in the 
resolution requested by Council Member Wooten. So I wonder um, if or how you would address that concern. I, I realize. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the main key difference here. It's not waiting to get a written assurance. It's expediting all that's needed to get to the investigation. We could wait for a written assurance. I don't know how long that's going to take. I don't even know if we're going to get it. So before I sign off on something that has that stipulation, there is no way I can know that. So I'd rather... Well, I, I, would, have, I mean, I think we're, we're, I asked for it. Yes, go right ahead. Right, right. But once, you know, but once, once I, I mean, will you get that before you sign it? I don't know. I'm not sure about that. So for me, I cannot sign off on, on something that specifically states I have to have a written assurance before proceeding, not knowing when that's going to take place. So there, you're right, that is missing for a reason, because what I'm asking to be done is to be done in an expeditious manner, um, whether that's put it on your top priority list to get it done. And that means we're, we're, we know that there's probably going to be some, you know, difference or conflict, you know, as far as the police department's concerned, where, where they do probably want to be focused in their area. And I understand that. But I think um, the, uh, the scope, the intention of an independent investigation is, is you know, just <laughs> that. You know, it's independent. It's on its own. It's going after certain things. It's going after certain goals. And it's only scope is to find out what happened. And, you know, Jim mentioned that in this particular resolution, it says that it's uh, the scope is more, you know, um, more constricted. It's not as, as broad, but that's not true. And here it says, and I've underlined it, it will examine everything that led up to the shooting events during the shooting the events that occurred after the tragedy, including a report of the FBI, because that's complete, that should be taken to an, uh, you know, account as well. And it should also focus on the shooter, his personnel file, promotional history, disciplinary records, um, everything associated uh, with the supervisors and the culture of the environment. Because I'm getting questions about a person who was said to be you know, his, his work was good, good performance. You know, all these things are being said about him. What was it that pushed him over the edge? People want to know that. So you're right. I'm focusing on that broad spectrum, and I'm focusing on the person who committed the act. What, why did he do it? People have a right to know what he did, why he did it, if we can find that out. And so, yes, that, that's in the resolution. I think it's important. People have asked me about it. People are concerned about, you know, the work environment, the climate of the work environment. What set this gentleman off? Okay, Barbara. Well, that's the problem. I'm not sure we're going to ever be able to know. And I don't know what people are expecting. I mean, is it that we're just going to come up with something? How are we going to know that's right? Uh, and that's why I say, what is it that people are, think that this independent investigation is going to be able to show? I think it's going to depend on facts, and I think we're going to get that from, I expect we're going to get that from these uh, investigations that are all going on now. And until we see what they give us, we're not going to know where the gaps are. I mean, are we setting ourselves up for turning some independent entity whom we don't who know who that might be loose to do anything and they may come up with something that is so far off the wall I mean they may not be right um, I don't know and and that's why I just don't know what we're expecting uh, I, I kind of wonder if this is just a blame game we've got to find somebody to blame and we'll just keep at it until we find somebody to blame and are we setting up accusing people of things that are maybe not right. I really think we need to think through all this and all these people who are asking for an independent investigation, tell us what it is you think we don't know and we won't know so that we know what it is we're trying to find out 
And what if it's not something we're going to know? I mean, it just may be that we don't know. That, that's a fact. Jessica? So I, I want to start off with this is, we don't, we don't know what we don't know, what we don't know. And we won't know until we ask the question. So firstly, this is, no matter which one of these is adopted, having an independent study is the most important thing. I would say I think it is completely inappropriate that the city manager facilitates this. Ultimately, everyone stops us here. And we can't have the city manager near this. Lyndon is probably the best option because he is hired by us, fired by us, and he doesn't have to answer to anybody except for us. I understand that there is, how do you make it truly independent? That's a challenge, because you can't, because we have to pay for it some way. So I think, I don't really have a problem, Sabrina, with any of the things that you want to include in your scope. I think there's probably room to merge those things, because the honest, honestly, we really need to, we need to look at what this person is and how he was. But on top of that, to Jim's point, we have to look at how we are handling our workplace situations. We need to know if there is a problem. Maybe we have a policy that's not appropriate and we can't, nobody wakes up one morning and just decides to do something like this. There is probably months and months and months of an environment that happens. <coughs> and, and I think that's part of the reason why we are asking for an or a independent investigation so that we can broadly look at all of the differing contributing factors. The other question I have, you said expeditiously. I don't, that's not anywhere in here. I understand that it says the city hereby authorizes the independent investigation, investigative organization to access information pertinent to the, et cetera. When does this start? I don't, I have a clear understanding. I understand it's vague, but I understand what Jim says. Jim says when we have written assurance. We don't know when that will be, but we have a timeline. We know when the timeline's gonna start. With yours, when does the timeline start? Tomorrow, six weeks, one month? That's what I'm trying to get an, an understanding of because I agree there are people that are grieving. I've talked to a number of city employees about this. One thing I can tell you city employees that I've talked to agree on is that we don't want to get in the way of the criminal investigation. And the first people that matter the most to me in terms of how we act as a body are the people that were in that building. And we need to respect what those people are living with. And I, I really want to try to understand what you mean by expeditiously, because that's to me that's just as vague as what this other resolution is saying, if, if that other resolution was vague to begin with. So when you ask the question, where is expeditiously listed, it's after the first paragraph, whereas the investigation should be conducted expeditiously and without delay. Okay, that's that. what it means, expeditiously without delay, but what, meaning, <coughs> give me a chance, meaning that we're not going to wait for written authority from whether we get that or not. We're going to find an independent entity and make sure that, you know, we authorize them to do what they need to do and let them get started. But who who is going to, so the city manager, so you're saying. And I didn't say that. And, and, now remember, I never said the city manager right. would be a part of would be a part of this. You know, um, I believe the city attorney mentioned who would would you know mention to that uh, Mr. Hansen would be a part of that instead of uh, the city attorney. So um, the council hereby directs the city manager manager to engage an independent organization. So. With this information here, I don't think those are, I'm not sure if those are my words. I'm not sure if I said the city manager. So I, that's, thank you for pointing that out. I will take that out because in my conversation, I never said that. But who would do it? Would do what? Who would, who would hire the entity? We, we've already established the city auditor could certainly go ahead, go through the process, find the entity, pay the entity, sign the contract. I think we've already established that that's something that would be appropriate versus the city manager. And I don't mean to, I just, this, that's what I mean, said. I said. And, and the, Jim said, the one that Jim's bringing forward says city auditor. I'm just trying to reconcile where the difference is. I understand ex, that you want this to be handled quickly, and I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have, that's not a point of contention. I think that there, I think that we could, 
with the section one on the bullet points, I think those could be merged yeah. because I think what Jim wants to include is equally as important as what you want to include. And I, I just agree. I think we need to have one voice on this. So I want to get to where you feel comfortable. Yeah, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable with the city auditor having more of a, uh, a having more of a involvement with just finding the entity, signing the contract, and then allowing the independent entity to do their job. I mean, I've seen it done before with auditors and, and organizations. They come in, they do their job, they don't need a whole lot of direction, they issue a report. Okay, Aaron, I, then I, Jim. I, I, I want to thank Jim again for allowing us to have this tough conversation, because it is a tough conversation, but it shouldn't be to the point where we are comparing um, apples and oranges. To me, and I'm like, Jessica, I see this, and I'm like, how do we make it one paper? Yeah. How do we, we take things from yours? Because I, I, I do see there are some language differences, but really, I mean, sem semantics, like we can, we can merge, we can expand on number one if will be. I think maybe you know, we can find a place where we can merge these together because I don't see that much difference other than the time. And I think we kind of clarify that it, 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 we, seem, we seem to have some consensus on the order. But I would really, I would really um, lead to give the floor to uh, Mr. Tower here with his expertise and legal background. And because I, I'm really trying to see is, okay, we really need to be one on this. We really need to show uh, a strong um, approach on this as a team. Um, going forward, and I don't see that there's either. I don't see night and day on these. I just see where it's like we're playing with words here. You know, how can we? But it's <clears> not. How can we merge it to, together? What are some of the key differences that you feel that that you absolutely have to have that's different from Jim's? I'm just not seeing the an independent investigation right away, like now, like okay. right away. Uh, okay, Start it right now. away. Okay, from now. And see, uh, she's not in agreement with that. No, I, I don't do think that. Jim is in agreement with that. I For me, that. that's a deal breaker. Okay. So okay. if you're not going to be in agreement with doing it, you know, expeditiously, as soon as possible, okay. that that's that's where I am, and um, and I don't see, I don't see myself moving from that, and again with. You know, if we can guarantee the involvement of the city attorney is going to be very limited, limited scope. Otherwise, city city auditor doing an independent study, and, and Ms. Henley mentioned that. How is that independent? This, a city auditor being involved in an independent study, I guess my that's a conflict of interest. Okay. All day. Okay, Mr. Wood, please. Well, see, for, first off, that's not, not even remotely accurate. The... The, What's that? The, the fact that the city auditor would be involved in the investigation. The, I mean, well, you I told me that he would manage it. So I was going off of what you said. Um, and I think, you know, once, like I said, once, it's, once it happens, you can't tell me that the city auditor won't, you know, no one knows what he will do. He's, okay. a, he's a part well, I've, of I've, it. I've got the floor right now. So the only thing well, I would take the floor. I'll, the thing I'll I would tell you is, question that you is have. The, the difference, and I agree with, with what. Um, Jessica and Aaron said that that other than the, the the thing about doing this regardless of the impact of the police investigation, which clearly I think would be incredibly reckless of us to do, everything else on here says the same thing. Your your resolution says directs the city manager to promptly engage an independent organization. This says direct the city auditor to engage an independent organization. It's the same language. Engage, engage. No, it's not. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at it. It says right here, it's the same words. I don't I, know if you've I had a chance, because obviously you yeah. missed the part that said city manager on here in, in like three spots. Well, but One sit, at a time, when you okay? When you sit down and you go, well, he's, he's saying things to me, and well, I'm, so that's I'm fine. just answering what reply. he's sure. saying. I'm, I'm done. And I okay. think one of the things is, I think the city's attorney office kind of kind of constructed them kind of the same because no. it, it's, it's easy the dates to are, use the same language. No. They, they were done five days apart. So. No, what I'm saying, Jim, is, you know, in my conversation, they, they didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so some language they did use over. Now, I would strike city manager at here in, this, in, in my particular resolution because I don't want that. So that's something I didn't catch. No, I just got it a few hours ago. So there are probably some other um, adjustments that need to be made. 
Okay, Mr. Tower. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I can address all of Councilwoman Wooten's concerns, but I thought one of them I'd just like to get straight, just to kind of clear it, see if we can move that one off the table. And I would direct the question to the city attorney. I'm assuming that this was written to fulfill what you thought were the sort of the minimum requirements of what had to happen to establish somebody to engage and receive a contract and monitor whatever, whatever the legal requirements are in city contracting, uh, legal requirements in city contracting, that you haven't added anything to it uh, more than what you think is sort of the bare minimum uh, in order to preserve this. I mean, if we can't, we've got to have somebody, it seems to me, <laughs> to, to interface in some way with the outside entity and that having that person be also the person who does the hiring and is involved in the contract makes it all the more convenient <coughs> for that person to do it. And it's someone who can operate without any further interference from us other than the initial direction. I mean, it seems to me we've kind of got what we need. Um, but but I'll let the city attorney respond to if I'm making myself clear, Mark, I, I can. The, the, the direction that I received from the, from the vice mayor and from the council member, uh, we made every effort to reflect what was asked in the two <coughs> resolutions. <coughs> My understanding of the intent and what we tried to accomplish was to identify the city entity that would be responsible for procuring and executing the contract. With respect to the resolution for Mr. Wood, we made specific reference to the city code because the city code specifically authorizes the auditor to go beyond the power of the city manager to say, give me every document that you have, department director or department member, that relates to this issue. So, so yes, the intent was to simply provide the minimum necessary to procure, issue, and administer a contract. Um, I did not have the understanding that either party wanted the particular city official identified in the resolution as actively participating in the investigation itself. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's responsive to my question, and I would, I would submit that the city auditor is just about the perfect person to do this because of the power that, and because of our personal confidence in him, if we're going to have anybody doing it, because of the authority that he's got to ask for every document from every department anytime <coughs> he wants. I, I just would ask Councilwoman Wooten on that issue what the city attorney is saying. We can't do any better than what we've done unless you want someone other than the, than the, than the uh, city auditor to be the point of contact. Uh, to administer this contract. I think uh, the title of liaison is would be appropriate. And I think I've already said I'm that sorry, who? the title of liaison would be appropriate for the city auditor to that's the role that I think he should she should play because someone has to be the liaison and that should be his title. That should be his involvement. It should be explicit. And as I've said before, I don't have a problem with him conducting the search for the organization. He can do that. He can allow the money to change hands, sign the contract. After that, that should be the limited scope of his involvement, period. And receive the contract, receive the, the all that's involved in that process, Jessica. Hey, you have a question yeah, for the please. Is there any kind of way we can just, will, will we have to find a third party investigator ourselves if we don't tell the auditor to do it? No. Well, it's best we stay that, out that's of That's bringing it. 11 politicians no. out of it. Well, we want politicians yeah, so I, out I of just, this. I would. And we'd be hiring our friends. I rely on the expertise at the table to say the city auditor needs to pass them off. Yeah. So. And, and I agree to that point. 
I will just reiterate that it was not my intent to draft, nor did I understand it to be Ms. Uh, Vice Mayor Wood's request to me to draft something that said that the auditor himself was involved in the day-to-day -day conduct of the investigation, and I don't believe that we wrote it that way. I, I, I thought I was writing what we intended to write was the, was the same thing, just with a different person. So, so if I have not worded it clearly, I can go back and try to reword it. But it was not the intent of the draftsman to make the auditor actively involved in the investigation. And that, to me, to no, I'm just, I'm just, no, I'm just saying I. If we didn't, if, 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 if I didn't draft it correctly and I wrongly gave the impression that the auditor was conducting the investigation himself or directly involved in it, that was not my intent in drafting. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm sorry. Okay, Guy and then Sabrina. Uh, I would just say I think the drafting is entirely proper to do exactly what he said. It appears to me to specifically avoid. I think we got off to... Unfortunately, Jim was using colloquially the word manage, and I think he meant it in the terms of contract management, not manage the actual investigation, mm -hmm. and that got us off on the wrong foot. I don't mm -hmm. see how you could draft this any more narrowly myself. But. And I think the only thing that I would say, if I can sure. say, is when I spoke with Jim, that's not what I, that's not the information that I received. Um, it was, you know, manage the, manage pretty much manage, I mean, I won't say manage the investigation, but he's the person that's going to manage everything. And that's what I got from the conversation. I think I mentioned it before about, you know, the different departments. Um, and so I took that away from our conversation, um, and, and I thought about it. I hear what you're saying now, and I'm in agreement as far as, as I just stated, the limitations. Um, and I think... You know, and even in getting this resolution to the table, it, it was tough. It was tough. And, you know, I was told that probably nobody would support it. But for me, that doesn't, that's not my goal. My goal is to get out, <coughs> I believe, uh, our two issues, <coughs> getting the investigation done right away, expediently, and then to make sure that it is indeed independent and it's an independent investigation without any appearance of conflict. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm standing on and that's what I would like <coughs> to see done and that's why you have the resolution. Okay. And anybody else? I thank everybody for their comments. Mr. Mayor, yes. Um, I, only if, if it's if, if if it is appropriate, I would just like to note that Council Member Abbott and I did submit a resolution for consideration next week related to mental health funding at the General Assembly session. And I would just say that there's often a connection between acts of mass public violence and untreated serious mental illness, and a discussion about reducing acts of mass violence. Um, and violent crimes must account for the role played by serious mental health illness. And that is why I've submitted it. I'm open to suggestions, open to feedback. I know Council Member Abbott would agree with me. We hope we can work on this together and speak uh, to this one part of the discussion that will occur at the General Assembly. Yeah, I, think also, I would think, and I didn't, I didn't run this by you before I say it, but I, I'm going to go on my gut. If there is a feeling that this needs or warrants more discussion, I think both Michael and I would be open <clears throat> to further discussion on that resolution as well. I really, Jim. So, and, and, and I was thinking about that too because honestly I didn't think this was going to take the turn that it did today either, but um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see an issue with that, but I, I wonder if it's it sounds like to me that might not be something that they're they're planning to do and maybe it's something that that might want to go into the to the traditional legislative package because mental health tends to be a a big ticket item that 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 they tend to keep kicking down the road. But but I'm 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 fine with it the way it is now to put it up there. I don't know that they'll take a look at it. But well, they may not, and they, and they probably won't. But that that's just the point. I think they should. Yeah. Um, and as one part of the discussion, 
I mean, I could go into it further, which I'm willing to do. Uh, I would also just note that we effectively have included this in the traditional legislative packet, and for whatever reason, it hasn't had its intended impact. Good point. So maybe this is the time to in incorporate this element of the discussion into the larger discussion about violence and about violence that's related to firearms. I would piggyback on that. That's, this does always seem to be the thing that gets cut, yeah. both at the state level and this level. It's, it always seems like this is the first thing we skinny down, and I think that's why we <coughs> felt it was so urgently to be discussed. But, you know, I, I, like Michael, welcome all feedback on it, and I think we want to make sure that we can speak as one as much as possible. Okay. Guy. Well, I, I, I think I know what you mean, Jessica, when you say the first thing being cut, you're talking about money, but, I mean, the first thing being cut typically when we're talking about firearms regulation are the are firearm safety things. They get, they don't even get a floor hearing. So they all, they all get cut. Uh, everything gets cut. And if we're going to talk about mental health without talking about firearm safety, then I have some fear the appearance will be that this council is not willing to deal with the firearm safety thing. And I would urge that I'm certainly perfectly happy myself to deal with the mental health part of it, but I think it ought to be done in the larger context of where do we, where do we stand, if at all, on firearm safety. Can, can I also add just yeah. a kind of a comment? I, I, I hope, I want to make it clear that what happened last week in terms of any deferrals on anything is I want, I, I hope that we will start budgeting into our meetings, and I guess this is a request, that we discuss this as much as possible with anything, because I really do believe this warrants an enormous amount of discussion, especially as time goes by, <coughs> hearing from different people about their different thoughts, and, and some people might not be comfortable talking right now, but will be in two weeks or in two months or whatever their appropriate timeline is. And I think it might be wise that at least at our workshops that we end our meeting with just a, just a general, hey, here's a pulse check on what's going on. I heard from so-and-so and this was their thoughts on it. Or I talked to my neighbor who happens to be a city employee and this is what he said. You know, I really, I do be, really believe we need to take as much time with this and, and heavily vet all the ideas that are coming to, for, towards us. I mean, we've, we've got a, We've got a conversation coming at us that none of us thought we were going to have to deal with. And I know Jim has said that a number of times. And I just, I really just hope we take a lot of time to talk about it. Okay, Sabrina. Can I just say that I'd like to know when we are going to have that discussion. Is it going to be during our governance se session um, uh, as far as we deferred that whole resolution? And definitely, we said we wanted to discuss it. When is that going to take place? Uh, I know Norfolk approved a, a resolution that was very similar in nature the same week that we deferred ours, and Richmond did as well. I heard people, and I heard what you said. We want to talk about it. We want to talk about it. When is that going to happen? You know, I, I would have loved to have that conversation today, but I know other things we talked about took up time. But that's a key discussion that we need to have among ourselves, and it can't be deferred indefinitely. We have to decide when we're going to talk about it and what position or stance we're going to take. Uh, I think that's important, and I believe the community is waiting for us to do it. Yes. I would like to see that we budget the time in every workshop. I don't think we'll be able to do it for every formal session that we have, informal and formal session, but I think we should be able to put 45 minutes to this until we've found a consensus I would add the other municipalities that are passing resolutions they did not they, they they are not impacted like we're impacted they don't have city employees that were in building two and I I understand the sentiment but I, I really do think we owe it to the people that we employ and we owe it to the people that we represent to have that conversation I agree with you I agree on one point. It, it may seem differently as far as Norfolk. I can say with Norfolk, the shootings, that they occur quite often. It may not be city staff, and that, that would separate us. However, they know 
the impact of gun violence and and they knew it was time to make a stance and I think the issue is the fact that you know uh, people want to know what you're going to do about gun violence what are we going to do about it we can't we can't let anything overcloud that that judgment um, people want to know what are we going to do Vic the families of the victims want to know I was asked when I was at vigils what are you going to do? What action are you, are you going to take? You can come to the vigil, you can come to the funeral home, but we want action. That's what I heard. Okay, Michael. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I would just like to say that when I, um, I, I said that I would try to find consensus. I said I would attempt to identify what areas where we agree. And that is why I have submitted this particular resolution because I believe it is one where we can agree. Um, the FBI released a study that indicated that 40% um, um, of the um, active shooters in, in, in these uh, in the events had um, received a psychiatric diagnosis. 70% had mental health stressors or mental health concerning behaviors prior to the attack, and 86% uh, had. Um, suicidal ideation or had made attempts, <laughs> suicide attempts before the, prior to the attack. So with that information tells me this is something that we can do. And I, I'm not saying it's the only thing we could do, but this is an action that we can take that hopefully we all can agree upon. So that was my intent, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay. Okay, at this point, just a quick summary and we'll adjourn. One of uh, the things that I brought forward, um, you know, during the tragedy when the vice mayor and I were being interviewed and asked about certain things, and I, I caution that making decisions when a community is in a state of high emotion is not necessarily the best time to make a lot of decisions. And I asked for some time, you know, to get through, um, you know, the family considerations and some other things. Uh, we do have uh, special sessions. We are a Dillon Rule State where we're going to, you know, things are going to be determined, you know, in Richmond in terms of what directions we may or may not have. We have an a, a investigation ongoing that I am confident that the police are going to give us some substantive answers. There will be discussion, but one of the things I said that we have to do it in such a way that we're talking around, we're, we're it's a reasonable discussion where we're looking for a consensus, what we have in common. And I'm afraid that premature discussions on it tend to politicize and, you know, uh, polarize, you know, during times like this. And, you know, that's why, you know, I, you know I'm you know, hopeful that we might be able to avoid to an extent. But you're 100 percent right. But let me say this. I'm 100 percent, you know, glad we had this discussion. This is a tough emotional time for all of us. And there are going to be ongoing discussions. And, you know, this is a beginning of a long journey, my friends. This is, uh, you know, once again, we have a lot of families and uh, victims and people that were in that building that we're going to have to continue to embrace for a long time now. But be assured that this body will be deliberative. We will do what's necessary to get the information out. Uh, and uh, I tell you what, I got 100 percent confidence in our police and our process that it's going to happen. So at this time, if it's okay, let's adjourn and thank you all for the conversation.